that want to share their experiences. Oh, yeah, so we, um, we use Zoom and um, a platform called Mentimeter. It's very similar to Kahoot. So with, with Zoom, you can actually do breakout rooms. So we've been taking teams of up to five people um, and you can split them into their own private room where they can discuss their answers. And we just kind of screen share um, the Mentimeter uh, platform, which um, basically runs all your questions, does all your scorekeeping, updates the standings. Um, again, if you, if, you, if, you, if you have used Kahoot, it's very similar. They have banks of questions already for you, so you can pull um, from their question bank. Um, we've, we kind of do like themed rounds, sports, pop culture. We do a picture round, so you screen share a picture, and they have to figure out um, the answer from the picture. We do TV show theme songs, music. You play music clips, name the artist um, and the song general knowledge uh, rounds. Another thing you can do with trivia is um, you, can, you, you can stream it on Twitch if you wanna go that route. Uh, Rec Without Borders, who is another um, group in uh, Nursa Partner in the States, they've been doing a trivia every Wednesday night. So you can just log on to Twitch and you do it on your own. So that's something a school can do. Um, can, can do on their own to their, to their intramural population. Um, they just pop onto Twitch and start answering questions. Uh, Twitch runs with an app called QuizKit. So you're just answering on the screen on the Twitch stream. Um, it, it's actually really cool. Again, reach out to any um, trivia or club groups on campus for collaboration. Um, I've, again, McGill had its own trivia club, so I've reached out to them. Um, try and get some help from them on running, kind of again, some cross collaboration there. We've also reached out to our sponsors um, for prizes. One of our sponsors was a restaurant that actually ran trivia every Tuesday night. So we've kind of collaborated with them. They have a whole list of questions for us. We kind of can tap into their clientele and they're still connecting with our student body um, as well. Question, how many people do you have? Just going uh, through the that, chat again. Oh, yeah. Ryan, can you hear me? Mainly talking about esports and geek X and mission control. Um, now my other Zoom is popping up on my other computer. Okay, um, any points on trivia? Anyone wants to add questions, thoughts? Nope. Okay, um, some more programming ideas if your facility's closed. Uh, I mentioned it before, but online board games um, and card games. Um, again, the, the goal of this is to, is to link um, random, question, uh, random students together or help um, friend groups play games together. Uh, sorry, someone is asking a question in the chat. Mark. I, you, I might have missed your question in um, once my presentation crashed. If you can go off mute, ask the question and I can help. Um, Megan from Brock, yeah, we had 40, we had 42 teams our first trivia night and around 200 people. So yeah, we just emailed everyone on I Am Leagues about it. Um, we posted on our Facebook, Instagram, um, so yeah, so we had, we had a pretty big turnout. Um, Wait, how are you getting by castle by using IM leagues to email about another program? You say that, that again, Tristan? Sorry. How are you getting by castle by emailing through IM leagues, your participants about a program that isn't related to the one they signed up for? Um, I, I don't, we use the IM League Message Center for, for a ton of messaging. Um, oh, so it's not email? No, so as okay. soon as they make uh, an IM League's account, um, they, IM League's has a whole message center on their own platform. So as soon as they're an IM League's member, we, we kind of message them um, stuff related to the program. So um, we- Yeah, we've just been banned from using IM League's at UBC, so. Or yeah, so any, I mean, any, 
league software you're using or platform you're using, you can, you know, use those communication tools, get it out to your participants, um, tell them when you're we, running the trivia night. We've only got email. That's our only option. Yeah. So we, we actually do an RSVP system through um, a Google form as well. So they have to RSVP their attendance and then we have their emails right there so we can communicate with the people that did register, tell them how to sign up on Zoom um, and, and kind of what the steps are to, to get the trivia night going. Any other questions that I might have missed in the chat when uh, my Zoom crashed on me? So, no, everyone's good. Okay. Um, yeah. So, going to um, online board games and card games. Again, it's just trying to link students together. Um, you can play right through some of the apps or on a website. Um, I, I have a list of resources that uh, I have shared in the PowerPoint. Um, but basically you could play Scrabble with friends, Yahtzee, Cribbage, you could play Catan. Um, basically they could send a screenshot of their victory or their score and you can update standings. Again, you can use IM leagues or your league software. You have a Catan league and whoever wins, you can set up a schedule um, with those players. Um, they send a screenshot of whoever won, that player now goes one and zero in your Catan league. There's tons of online games out there. Um, that, that have apps so that are mainly free. Um, there's other platforms where you need to buy the license. So I don't know if anyone's heard of Steam, um, but there's, there's resources like Table, Tabletopia, Tabletop. Basically, if you buy that on Steam, it gives you access to a, a ton of board games um, that, that your students can use. Um, Anything else I'm missing? Again, I've reached out to our board games club on campus to so potential collaboration. Uh, even if you don't want to organize maybe a league for these board games, you can just compile a list of resources um, similar to the ones I have on the PowerPoint. You can just send these out to all your students. Be like, hey, if you ever want to play a game with your friends, here are some cool links um, um, for you to use. One, my favorite one is called Board Game Arena. Um, it's, it's basically free to use. Some games they'll charge you, but for the most part, it's free. Um, you can play a ton of games on here. So that's a good resource for, um, for getting it started. I'm just gonna try and email the PowerPoint to my other computer so I can get it up to you guys. Any other questions about board games or online games, card games? No, we're good. It actually looks like Sandra has a question. She's got her hand up in chat. Yeah. Uh, is anyone using Fusion? It's not I am leagues. Are there any non? Physical clubs still active at this time. Hey Ryan, can you hear me okay? Yeah, totally. Uh, this is Sandra from St. St. Mary's University in Halifax. Um, yeah, my two questions are, at our university, our setup is um, separate. The non-physical fall under our student union and the physical fall under the athletics and recreation. So I'm wondering if, um, it sounds like you have more connection with your non-physical clubs at your university. Is that, is that correct? And if other ones don't, like, are you starting to collaborate uh, at this time? Because mostly all of our non-physical ones are pretty much gone. They um, only come back in the fall. Yeah, I, that's, that's a good question. I literally sent out emails yesterday. Um, I thought about the idea last week. I was like, hey, there's probably some clubs on campus that are dedicated towards esports, board games, um, and trivia. So I literally reached out yesterday. Um, I mean, clubs are going to be a huge question mark in the fall, too. If, if students aren't on campus, are these clubs still going to be running? So, so that's a big question mark as well. Um, but I think, I think it's a great opportunity to collaborate. Like, I mean, our, our 
our clientele, like, you know, they, they want kind of that competitive environment, something to stay connected with their friends, their former teammates. So if we can kind of connect with someone on campus that has an expertise in that area, um, I think it's good cross uh, promotion for both areas. Um, but yeah, I haven't heard back from these clubs yet. So um, but I just think it's a good idea to at least kind of look on your campus, see what other help is, is out there for you. Um, Joni at UVic is using, can you explain that Joni or is it a gaming platform or app for esports? Hi everybody, Joni from UVic. Yeah, so we're using GeoScore and it's a gaming platform and it's, it, there's a fee attached to it. It's like, I think $136 US a month um, for each of the games that you use. And so far, they've done an incredible job at helping me get up and running. I mean, I, up until this point, was pretty adamant that gaming wasn't the way that our, the direction that we wanted to go. It wasn't, you know, and listening to some of the other questions, it wasn't conducive of physical activity or any of the philosophy that athletics and rec sort of stuck to. Um, but enter pandemic and now we have to be pretty creative so for us we're creating a three-year plan and we're hoping by the end of three years we'll have dedicated space with sponsorship i reached out to durham college um, they have a, a fairly huge dedicated space that they're using and a ton of sponsorship from spider and lenovo and some big names um, who have donated equipment and money annually they also have a, i think five full ride scholarships now so they've sort of helped me shape the plan moving forward. And then from there, we're hoping to connect with UVSS and see that's our student, um, that's our student uh, clubs on campus. We don't have any of our rec clubs that are running gaming, but UVSS has a ton of them. So we're hoping to connect with them, come back in the fall. There's been some email connection right now, but um, I don't know about anybody else or, or sort of where you guys are at in terms of any of the restrictions being lifted, but we're looking, Originally, it was July 1st, and now it looks like June 1st will be opening and some of our programming will begin. So I'm hoping that once we get more people on campus, um, we will be able to create some kind of soft space for the programming to happen on campus versus remotely. But until then, we're just hoping to get as many people playing for free. None of our programming is being charged this summer. So if we're able to create leagues as well, we're, um, everything's going to be free. We just want people to come back and, and be associated with us in a positive way. Um, so yeah, back to GeoScore. I think they're great. They're young kids. I mean, I'm a middle-aged woman who's never picked up a gaming controller in my entire life. So for me, it was all about education. And they've done a really good job. They've been super supportive. supportive. And our admin, so here's a question being directed by administration to move. So I just lost the question. Uh, yes. So to answer that question, it was 100% a directive by our administration to move towards esports. And I think everyone has sort of UBC's model in mind in terms of generating a ton of revenue and having a ton of participation. But I don't know if any of you have been to Victoria. We are not the same as Vancouver. So it's a destination school. There's still 22,000 people, but it's a very different vibe over here than what you'd get on the mainland. So what flies over there, a ferry ride away isn't going to fly here. So we're doing our best. We are using Instagram and Facebook to do all, all of our promotions because as I said, we can't use IM leagues on campus. So that's been a bit tough to try and stay connected, especially because we share one Instagram account with our entire Vikes Recreation um, group. So that's promoting fitness and clubs and climbing wall and everything at the same time. So I don't know how effective it's gonna be, but we'll see in terms of uh, the first round June 5th and go from there. Awesome. Thanks for that. Um, Mark's also asking about not all rec participants want competition. Um, how are we facilitating engagement with them? Um, I mean, I, I have heard of Animal Crossing uh, in different IM webinars I've been on. That's, that's totally an online game you can use. Um, but yeah, I think some of these online board game, card games, even some esports, it doesn't have to have a competitive vibe to it. Um, you can totally kind of make it more recreational. Um, Peter, slightly off topic. Um, okay, how come you can't use IM leagues? 
Okay. All right, so some more programming ideas. Um, movement, steps, kilometer challenges. Um, has anyone kind of um, experimented with these? I know UBC had like a seven day challenge. I know it kind of ties in with your, your recreation or your, or sorry, your, your fitness kind of classes. Um, has anyone kind of had any of these challenges going out on social media? Laura, we have a great free app for step challenge called Count It. Um, works with so many different step counters. That's sweet. Um, yeah, so you could have a continuous competition throughout the semester for most steps. You can give out prizes um, for a weekly high or the overall winner. Um, there's so many different apps out there that can count your steps. So they just need to send a screenshot, maybe a selfie of their activity. Again, this is content you can post on your social media as well. Um, you could have, you know, run challenge, run or walk challenges, run a 5K or a 10K, and you get entered into a chance to win a prize. Just send proof again, screenshot of your app, um, your route, um, and a little selfie. Again, good social media material. Um, Strava is also a really good app. You can kind of make your school its own kind of run club in a sense, and you can design a challenge. So, hey, for the month of September, you have to run 50 kilometers. And then, you know, you, if you get that, if you achieve that challenge, um, you actually can earn a badge through the app, through Strava. And then you can also give out some prizes or if you, you reach that mark, you're entered in a chance to win something. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of cool things you can do with Strava. Again, since it's kind of um, a movement challenge, you can partner with your fitness center or your instructors. Um, you know, they could maybe post um, daily workouts or daily activities, and then you can send it out to all your intramural participants and be like, hey, we're having this challenge. Um, kind of get some collaboration going there. Uh, again, some resources there, um, Strava app, the 2020recreationmovement.com. Um, that's actually a really cool thing happening in the States where it's a university versus university challenge. So if you're at the University of Texas and one of your students runs 5k like they get a bunch of points and then you move up your school moves up or down in the standings uh some canadian schools have talked about maybe being getting on that website and being able to start tracking their participants uh movements so i know we're waiting on an answer for that and again i posted the recreation um at ubc they've they've done a seven day movement challenge so you can get some ideas there as well it's going through the the chat um, participants. Just one thing about that movement challenge that's actually run through our physical activity department. Right. Lucky enough to have it has nothing to do with intramurals. Yeah, no, but yeah, totally. Again, it's just uh, such a such a unique time that it's it's something that we could um, you know post to our intramural participants and give out our prizes or our champ shirts or our, our mugs, whatever you're offering. Um, as your normal prizes, again, we could kind of um, push this to to our intramural participants, give them something to do, um, keep them connected to our program. But I, I, this sort of leads to a question I have for for everyone here: is how many of these initiatives that we're doing are just make work projects, and what value do they have to? our potential roles and our potential portfolios moving forward, or are these just band-aid solutions for you know I'll be very blunt here as i want to do is just to justify our paychecks um, and i'm just wondering how and i've i've pushed back personally for things like esports here and um and some other things just because it's not something that's for me it's not going to be sustainable after we get our quote unquote regular programming back on board I just don't have the capacity to run my regular programming and esports. It's just not there. And based on the way things have gone, I don't see, you know, with how much money all these universities are losing right now, is whether the likelihood we're going to get additional resources in terms of staffing and whatnot in the next two or three years based on the hit we're all taking right now. So if we can't resource it properly for the next two or three years, 
And we're already, I would assume most of us are pretty limited and maxed out in terms of what our capacities are once we're up and running again, whatever the new normal looks like, that might be different as well. But I just wonder about the value of pushing these things forward or is there more value in terms of trying to figure out ways and making our, what our programming will be once we come back that much more effective and um, innovative and whatnot. For me, it's, I, I really struggle with, with, with a lot of these things because they're not really intramurals. And I know we do have to be creative to, again, to justify our paychecks, but uh, the reason I push back pretty hard to my management saying like, let me work on things that are actually going to be long-term beneficial. Especially since, as you said, a lot of these things are just, they're free. They're not revenue generating. They have debatable connection points back to our, the physical model, um, all that sort of thing. So it's, I know a lot of people are in a lot of different situations yeah. and, there's no one band-aid or one solution for all, but that's just one thing that I've really been considering over this is just what is the overall worth of this if we can't sustain it? Mm -hmm. If I could speak to that, and I don't know, can, can you hear me, Tristan? Yeah. Yeah, perfect. So I think that's a wonderful question, and that's kind of what I've been alluding to in the chat, asking more questions, is really this idea of, I think the challenge is we're all struggling to put our current structure and programs into like a round a square peg in a round hole and so we're trying to translate you know prizes and scheduling and the software we currently use first and then trying to fill that programming and i, I think really what tristan is saying and, and i agree wholeheartedly is what about the participants? Who are we serving here and what is that purpose? So one of the questions I asked about esports is, do the gamers need us to, do, to facilitate their play? I play online on silly games and word for friends and stuff. And so if it is a, to connect them to our rec programs, which is it's not a bad idea, but I don't hear a lot of strategy or planning to say, what are we going to do to transition them? And if it's just them going into our facilities and hoping that, oh, hey, they've got basketball court, maybe I'll play basketball. I think that's not gonna be the best use of our time. There could be ways where we translate that into physical activities and, and, and pairing them. I don't know what that answer is, but again, I, I really feel like we're putting the program first rather than our students first. And so when we think about our students, what do they need from us to feel connected, to feel like they belong to the institution and to our rec departments? How do we facilitate their wellness journey and their physical activity? So one of the things a lot with like, even when we talk about virtual programming and virtual fitness classes and that, my fear is we're speaking a lot to those that are already in our systems and most likely they're gonna be okay finding out you know, how to work out when the facility is not there or an instructor is not there. If we have the time and wherewithal, and Tristan mentioned this too, and I agree, is that, you know, we all have different resource structures and things. And so if it works for you, great. But my fear is a lot of organizations and institutions are going to put in a lot of energy, resources, time, trying to figure out something like esports, trying to commit space and resources and time. And then we forget that that's really not even our wheelhouse. Collaborating with the esports and other clubs on campus is a fabulous idea, but we just kind of already argued against why we shouldn't be running them is because we already have great student clubs and organizations doing great work. So how can we not take it over? How can we just support them? And maybe it is, hey, we can give you some prizes, we can give you space in our facilities, we can do this, but we don't necessarily need to run it because it's being run well by these clubs. So when we come back to what does this new normal look like? What will our programs, can we even have intramurals the way they are? Maybe there's a new way to run our intramurals. Let's look at the participant, the student, and what they're looking for, and how can we best, so my feel is that we should be taking this time to not talk about what we're doing, but what can we be doing, or what does the future look like, and strategizing with staff and partnerships, and, and you know, and then it comes down the line, and I get it that some institutions are, well, I'm being directed by administration, so, you know, and in that case, then you do what you got to do, but a lot of us are probably being asked these questions by administration going, what should we do? And, and we're just trying to fill it up. And maybe now's the time to take it slow and think about, okay, 
when we get back to some sense, how are we living our mission, vision, and values for our rec and athletics department? And are these programs, what we're talking about, is that the best use of our resources to, to fulfill that mission? And, and for some, it might be. Many that I've seen, it's not. Esports doesn't necessarily fit because if they were saying, well, it's a great socialization tool, well, so is poker, so is Animal Crossing, so is board game, so is the anime club, so is the, you know, the Dungeons and Dragons club. But we're not talking about them. We're only talking about esports because it has the word sports in it. And, and I believe there are some great connectivity we can have with them, but I don't think it's the be all and end all. And we should really focus on our goals and outcomes and how we can better use our resources and, and, and finances and staff to facilitate that healthy wellness journey. No it's, no, it's a great point. Um, again, like, like you said, a lot of people are kind of dictated by their administration. Um, we were, we were kind of just asked, you know, given these scenarios, what kind of programming could you offer if we keep the, the student athletics fee, like what can we offer them? So we're really just trying to think about so many different ideas. You don't have to implement all of them. You, you don't have to implement any. Um, it's just really trying to, to think outside the box, unique things that, you know, our participants, our normal clientele, you know, might like to do um, and, and then kind of connect with other people on campus that um, are kind of doing these things um, and, and kind of work together to, to create a new sense of community. And I think that's, that's a huge goal amongst intramurals across, I mean, everyone's program, you know, you're trying to build a sense of community um, in any way possible, really. So it doesn't have to be necessarily sports related especially during this time um, if we're just bringing people together to do an activity i, I think everyone kind of wins in, in that sense so again these, these are kind of just ideas just throwing stuff out there um, possible things your schools could could be running um, again uh, i i haven't even started exploring a lot of these options so i'm sure there's a lot of holes in a lot of them but i just wanted to kind of throw out a lot of ideas that I've seen from other schools or, or on, di on different nurse, uh, I am calls. Um, so, oh, go ahead, Kevin. Um, yeah. So I was just kind of raising my hand because I think the Mark hit upon a lot of good things with what he said. Um, that being said, I think that we need to try to understand why our students participate in intramurals and if esports does kind of achieve some of those goals. And I quickly wanted to touch upon, I did, um, so I know a few of the, you guys were on my master's uh, research presentation, which basically asked students what benefits they get out of intramurals. Um, and when we looked at 10 things for health and wellness, the last, the, the least thing that they benefited from with intramurals was weight control, and the second least was strength level. Uh, but when you're looking at the top couple of things, it was feeling of well-being, overall health, uh, and stress management were the top three. And so that's nothing to do with fitness, those top three. Um, so I think when we think esports, I think when we think about campus rec, we automatically think fitness. But I think that people participate in intramurals, not necessarily always to stay fit, more because of the social benefits and, and those outcomes. So we need to understand, I think, why our students participate in our sports and programs. Um, and if they're not participating in them to stay fit and for physical activity, if they're more participating in, in them because of the social benefits and the self-esteem, then I do think that these online activities can play a role uh, because they, they do have some of these positive outcomes. And if we are trying to get students to interact with each other on campus, it's better than students interacting with the strangers online. So if I can take one student at my school and have him interact with another student at my school online, rather than them interacting with total strangers in games, I think that's beneficial because it could potentially create a friendship on campus between those two students, um, just by creating that interaction point. So I think that's, that's where, for me, some of these online type activities start to serve a purpose, is that sense of community and the development. And I, I kind of ignore the fitness um, element when I'm starting to think esports and online stuff. I know people are like, oh, well, well we've got to, you know, add this fitness component and stuff. I go, you know what? That That's not the purpose that they're serving. The purpose that they're serving is creating interaction points and potentially developing friendships between people at the university 
Um, and if you have a group on campus that's already doing it and they don't want your help and they're doing it great, absolutely maybe support them a little bit. But if they do want the support of campus recreation um, and maybe we can grow their uh, program themselves or better help them facilitate it, I think that there's definitely uh, some value that we can add and, and help them out with. Great points, Kevin. Uh, someone else wanted to jump in there or not? I was just going to say that um, with esports or doing any programming right now, it also then comes down to what your own institution um, thinks is important in regards to keeping the students that we already have engaged if we were on campus engaged. Uh, if we're collecting those ancillary fees, so I think it was uh, Julia from Windsor had that question that people were answering in the chat, um, which is a good point, because if we're collecting those fees or not, and what level of programming and being in the spring and summer, completely different than during the school year when the majority of all of our programs are um, running. So going through that, but then also, so, Brock specifically, I put together and kind of just put out a double elimination bracket for uh, Madden and NHL, because that's what um, a brief poll said that um, students were interested in. And, but promoting out right now with not being on campus, I'm not reaching any new participants. I am advertising through our social media, so our recreation social media, as well as then through I'm League, so past intramural participants, to then get participants for this league. So I'm keeping our current um, participants engaged in some way, but I'm not getting any new participants or new students that um, may then find recreation as um, something that may be useful for them, as if we were walking through the halls on campus if students were there or anything like that. Um, so that's one thing that I find difficult as well is that we're not, if we're trying to start esports during this time or start any new programming, you probably are only uh, reaching students that are already engaged in the programs that we offer. Um, so that's just one other thing to kind of add to the list of everything that we are uh, thinking of and trying to do to stay engaged, stay relevant on our campuses maybe for some, um, anything that way as we try and figure out or as we kind of wait and see what then timing is for getting back to um, getting back on campus, having students back on campus, whether that is um, coming up shortly for maybe some in um, BC, whereas then here in Ontario, still not uh, sure yet. So it's gonna be different for Kind of all of us that way as well yeah good point megan that that was the first reason why um i wanted to run esports um was to to reach our current intramural participants and and offer them something hey we just canceled all of our championships um let's you know let's offer something um keep them connected keep them engaged so, so that was my number one reason in in running the fifa tournament um last month and i got we we got some pretty good response from it and um, going back a little bit to Kevin's point, um, I've, I've previously reached out to badminton clubs, table tennis clubs, and we've ran um, tournaments together. So um, usually when I have reached out to these campus clubs, um, we usually get really good feedback and we usually end up do collaborating. So um, I, I think it is worthwhile kind of reaching out to them, even though if they, you know, they're running it really well, they're, you know, they have, you know, they have it down down to a science what they're doing. I mean, they're always, they're, they always love to get new people, new eyes onto their club and, that, and that's kind of where that collaboration happens. Um, so we're gonna move on to um, scenario two. One last thing for scenario one, it's, it's kind of funny, but um, you, th there is a possibility of having a home dart league. Um, participants would need to have a board in their home, um, but there is the, the pro dart, uh, circuit over in Britain. They're doing a league. I also actually started a league with over uh, 40 people now. All you need is a video chat and a dart or a webcam and a dartboard. You can use your webcam, uh, your webcam on your laptop as well. So 
if you ever want more information on that, you can reach out to me, but it's actually really, really fun and totally doable. Um, just so, to make, yeah. ask Ryan just a quick question. Um, one thing that I've noticed, uh, I am quite big into the video game and esports scene just through various aspects of my life. And one thing that's become very apparent uh, because of the pandemic is that if you don't have a laptop, webcams are becoming extraordinarily expensive due to the scarcity. Right. I'm just wondering if anybody has seen that and addressed it or found sort of a cheap option that might be uh, sort of wholesale that we can maybe take advantage of in terms of a group. Because you used to be able to get a webcam for 20, 30 bucks like just a real basic uh, starter thing. Now you can't really find anything for less than a hundred, 125 bucks. This would be to record esports games or? Well, I mean, just even what you're talking about with regards to the starts league yeah. or yeah, just um, for any of that type of stuff, just as we, if we're looking to go more digital and more online things, yeah. things like webcams are going to be becoming more and more prevalent. Now I know most students, um, do have a laptop right. as opposed to a desktop PC. Um, but those people who are much more into gaming will have a PC and not a laptop. Yeah. And they won't have a webcam built in, so they have to buy one. Now, these are very like fringe things, but just yeah. things to consider. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, cell phones would work well too, and you can connect them um, right to your laptop and use that as your camera. They actually film much better than the laptop itself. Um, so that's definitely another option. Thank you, Ruben. Uh, yeah, so scenario two, if uh, we kind of only have 10 or so minutes, um, if your facility is open um, with social distancing measures, I mean, it's hard to predict what those measures will exactly be. I'm sure it's gonna change depending on the province you're in, depending on your institution. Um, but these were just some quick ideas um, that I kind of came up with. Um, obviously, smaller team sports or individual sports, so badminton, tennis, squash, pickleball, and table tennis would, would kind of came up right off the top of my head. Um, Quebec just allowed tennis and golf um, to, to start up again, so, so these are definitely options that are looking um, bright for the future. Um, 2v2 volleyball, so again, you're just you're having less people on the court. Um, cross net is kind of like a four square volleyball game. Um, if you Google it, it's, it's kind of trending at the moment, but you are kind of in close quarters. So I'm not exactly sure um, if that's the best option. Same kind of with spike ball, you're only four people, but again, you do come kind of close contact with each other. Um, volleyball is kind of volleyball played in a squash court. Again, it would be kind of 2v2 or three on three. So again, another, another option with just less people. Um, my personal favorite is getting lawn games going. Um, so these, again, you can play outdoor on your fields or inside a court if, if, if you have it. Cornhole is only four people and you can really space out based on who's throwing the bean bags at each time. Can Jam is kind of a Frisbee um, throwing game. Again, you're, you're pretty far apart from all your opponents. Um, washer Toss, same, same kind of deal as Cornhole. Um, Koob, uh, Mokley, they're, they're kind of these tossing games with uh, wood objects. Again, if you Google them, um, they're pretty cool. Ladder Toss, Croquet, Bocce. Again, these could all be run as individual leagues or you run a lawn games uh, league and each week you kind of change up which lawn game you're playing could kind of have that multi-sport tournament vibe. Um, again, you would probably have to invest uh, in this equipment, but it's honestly not that expensive. And we've, we found, we, we have cornhole cam jam, can jam and washer toss, and we've kind of found ways to use them in, in different tournaments and, um, you know, usually the first nice day in spring, we have an open house on our field type thing. Um, so we kind of have some of these materials already, but they're honestly not that expensive. Um, just going to read the chat. Um, 
also can need to consider even though the players are spaced out your hands are touching objects exactly like if you're both touching the same frisbee or you're both touching the same bean bag that's that's totally an issue um again that's i'm no health expert so i don't really know what kind of the rules will be um, regarding that uh, so are, are you washing the equipment after each game um I have some slides later about, about that potentially. Uh, three on three basketball. Um, Frisbee golf was another thing I thought could be cool if you play on your stadium field. Um, you can kind of create some obstacles that the Frisbee has to go around first and you kind of create like a three hole course or something. Um, could be an interesting way of, of doing things. Uh, again, you could have a dart league, but you could have it in house if you have an empty wall or or space in your facility. Um, any other ideas people have uh, come up with in terms of kind of social distancing type of activities that we could offer? You can chime in the chat or go off mute. Yeah, this is uh, Riley from U of A. We've also looked at doing potentially um, an indoor triathlon style where we have our swimming pool and indoor spin bikes that we can utilize and space them out. Um, or we've even done in the past where we've gone down to a, a large park downtown Edmonton and did a long distance um, relay run where the loop of the park is about four kilometers. So you're in a team of three um, and it's kind of like a long distance relay race. So we're looking at bringing back a couple of those ideas. Awesome. Yeah, I kind of thought about track events um initially too um so yeah that'd be cool that that triathlon um, idea any others sorry the the one at ubc that we're considering is um the research isn't quite in yet but using our aquatic center just because the water itself is chlorinated um, it's still got a lot of challenges with change rooms and waiting and all that other stuff around it, but that stuff can be mitigated through appropriate facility procedures. Whereas the thing that's limiting us everywhere else is even if we do everything else perfect, the sport itself says they have to be in contact. Social distancing is not a possibility. Even volleyball, you're going to, there's going to be contact. Yeah. Um, Whereas at least with what being in the water, whether it's inner tube water polo, or if you're lucky enough to have basketball hoops in your aquatic center, things like that, you're constantly in a relatively disinfecting environment and you can control all those other aspects. So that's, we don't have a hundred percent proof yet that that's that, that the chlorine is strong enough to kill the virus. Uh, um, but it is one of the things we're, we're looking into most closely for startup. Tristan, has there been any talk about then lifeguards being present and then if there is an emergency or if they do need to kind of go in and save someone or perform CPR, any of that, um, issues with that close contact? Yeah, it would be the same thing if, if they were, the facilities open at all, right? Um, so it would be the same risk. Um, right now, our lifeguards do our first aid generally for our intramurals that run there whereas all our other facilities we we do our own first aid um, just because of the much higher level of training that they have compared to our intramural staff um, but yeah it's definitely a risk uh, but it's a risk they're taking when the community's in there when public swims in there when swim clubs in there things like that so if it's okay to do those other things we suspect it'll be okay to do our programs so as of right now, your pool is kind of planning on partially opening or opening? Oh, no, they've got degree. no chance of opening in the near future, but... Oh, okay. <laughs> like, sorry, like, we, our, our intramural program even normally goes pretty much dark during the summer. Like oh, we okay. Um, we run one in, a, like, community soccer league where we just try and make some quick money, and we run uh, some programs for international students that come just for the summer. Obviously, those are all canceled for the summer, so we're mostly in just planning mode for the fall. We're oh, this fall planning for okay. September first. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Any other ideas out there? Again, a lot of these will depend on.
kind of what your university does. Um, if, if classes are online, like you're probably not expecting many students to even come back. So then you're kind of really working with students that live um, in the area um, or your community members, if you are allowing them to play in your intramurals. Um, so that, that obviously has a huge impact on, on what you can offer um, as well. So kind of my last slide here is just um, some social distancing measures. Again, I, I feel like this will kind of be all out of our hands, but additional hand washing stations, cleaning, cleaning equipment, maybe plexiglass to cover the check-in stations or, or limit exchange of IDs, like maybe not even check IDs anymore, um, or they flash them. Um, no more lending equipment or pennies. If, if you're playing a Frisbee game, they have to bring their own Frisbee. Um, again, a number of people allowed in your building or on a court or surface, then if all these people go to the locker room right away, like, again, these are kind of issues out of our hands that, you know, the school and, and facilities will kind of have to figure out, um, but some things to think about. Um, I had, yeah, so just some some costs um, with scenario ones, uh, scenario one and two, any software licensing subscriptions for your online activities. Again, think about new equipment. Um, it, it's a good point. Are, are we just going to buy this equipment f as a band aid to get programming going for the for the short term? Is it worth it to buy this? All these new equipments? Will we run a pickleball league in the future? Or is it just going to be for a, a one year period? Um, these are all good questions. That you have to think about. Um, you probably won't need a full staff uh, if if you're limited with your with your activities. Um, and again, what types of fees um, are you going to be charging is another thing to think about. Um, any other questions, topics, ideas? We were supposed to go to two, but I'm. I can stay on if other people want to stay on, talk more esports. I'm sorry if I missed all your questions earlier when I when it crashed. Um, we can go back to any other topic if anyone wants. Um, just one other thing about one of the last slides you had up there in terms of other things that can be done. Um, I've actually been in contact with a colleague from uh, the University of Auckland, um, where New Zealand's much further ahead in this process than we are. So just sort of learning from people who are already about to, to get back into it a little more than we are and one of the biggest things that they their sport body has said they need to have to get back up and running is the ability to contact trace and i think that'll be one of the biggest things that we're going to have to consider is being able to identify every single person and exactly when they were in our facilities and running in our programs and who they're interacting with um, I know some some programs have that automatically and it's sort of built into their processes, but I know some others uh, don't track it quite as vigorously, and that'll probably be one of a, ma a major holdup if you aren't tracking those that level of detail within your participant base. Yeah, that's a good point. Any other topics, questions? All right, I got nothing in the chat, so that's it for me. Thanks again for uh, for tuning in. Um, we'll we'll get a participation list from everyone that attended. We'll send out the recording. I'll send out the PowerPoint, um, and yeah, we 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 kind of have all each other's contact info now, so we can um, kind of get together more often as a group whenever these webinars happen. Um, we're always looking for other hosts as well. If anyone um wants to help out um we you know we'll, we'll definitely be running another session soon so it'd be great to have have another host but thanks for tuning in sorry about the technical technical difficulties if i missed any of your questions if i missed a raised hand uh it was a little hectic at the start but uh hope, hopefully everyone enjoyed it adios thank you thank you thanks everyone have a good day